Office um, by Ms. Storr, um, who's a consultant paediatric orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge. So the plan for this evening is that we will have a lecture, then we'll have some uh, polling questions, which we'd like you to answer. It's all anonymous. Um, and then Ms. Storr will talk through the answers with us. Um, we will then ask any questions. So during the lecture, if you have a question, pop it in the chat. We'll keep an eye out for that and we'll ask it at the end if it's not already been answered. Um, after that, we'll stop recording and we have three spaces for anybody that wants Viva practice this evening. If you could let um, Hannah or Lydia from ORUK know um, and then we'll invite you forward for that. So um, the session is recorded and it will be available on YouTube in a couple of days. So if you miss any part of it, you don't need to panic. You can always go back and watch again. Um, for if you want to step forward for a Viva, we encourage that. That's the best way to learn. It's better to make mistakes here with us than it is in your actual exam. And um, we've all done it and uh, we know how stressful it is, but it's honestly the best way to learn. Um, just a reminder that we do have the all day intensive FRCS mock Viva courses coming up. We've got one this Saturday, which only has observer spaces left. And then we've got one in December and one in January. So that's available to book on the um, Orthopaedic Academy website or on the Orthopaedic Research UK website. I think the Orthopaedic Academy website directs you to ORUK to book the course. Okay, um, so without any further ado, I am going to hand you over to Miss Kuldeep Store, who is going to talk to us about everyday children's fractures. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon, uh, or good evening rather. Um, um, I'm talking about um, the sort of questions that you working orthopedic surgeons get asked in clinics. Um, I, um, a lot of it is to do with the FRCS uh, curriculum, but not all, because patients have a tendency to confound us and not all their questions are curriculum based. Um, so I am a, I've been a consultant for over 10 years. I um, work in a major trauma center where I look after adults and children. I do a weekly paediatric fracture clinic. Um, so I see about 200 patients a month, most of them children. And the questions that I have got um, today, I hope are questions that you've been asked. They've all been questions I've been asked. And um, have a quick look at these questions. And if you just give me a wave or a thumbs up, um, 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 do switch your cameras on. I, it's, it's very weird to, for me to be talking to um, um, in the open uh, like this. Um, just give us a wave if you've had those sorts of questions before. Yep. Okay, so one of the questions that um, um, I get asked a lot is, will the limb straighten after this fracture? Nowadays, particularly in my hospital, but in most hospitals, we um, x-rays are digital on a PAC system. Um, parents in particular get taken uh, to where the radiographer stands um, behind the screen as their child is being x-rayed, which means that they are looking at the computer as x-rays are taken. And so by the time they see you in the fracture clinic a few minutes later, they are sometimes driven to distraction with the x-ray that they've already seen. And part of the consultation is about reassurance about that x-ray that they've seen over the shoulder of the radiographer. So will the limb straighten after this fracture? The answer is probably. If it's close to the physis, um, it will straighten quicker. If the deformity is in the same plane as the adjacent joint movement, it will straighten better. And the more growth the child has left, the more likely it is to straighten. So here we've got a neonatal femur fracture. You can see that it's in the proximal third of the femur. Look at the amount of angulation the proximal fragment is undergoing due to the pull of the psoas tendon. That's a good 70 degrees angulation there between the proximal and the distal fragment. But the adjacent joint has polyaxial range of movement. The range of movement of the hip joint includes flexion and extension, so remodeling is expected to occur. It is reasonably close to the physis, is in the proximal third, and oh my goodness, does the neonate have growth left? They have plenty of growth left. 
So this is the fracture about three weeks later, um, still a 70 degrees curve. Look at the amount of callus. It's like a cauliflower of new bone um, around the um, um, fracture. And this is the fracture about five years later. They still have a visible, uh, sorry, bow on the X-ray, but they do not have a visible deformity on um, physical cosmetic examination. So will the limb straighten after this fracture? The answer is maybe, and it depends. It depends on how close it is to the physis, whether the angulation of the fracture is in the plane of the adjacent joint range of movement, and depending on the age of the patient. So let's have a look at some fractures in a bit more detail. Here we have the distal radius fracture, the commonest fracture in children. This is a real life patient. I think that this is a well reduced fracture, reduced in the emergency department. There's a bit of translation, no angulation, but neither in the coronal or the sagittal plane, and there's no rotational deformity. This dad was so aggressive with me in the um, uh, in the clinic. The parents were undergoing a separation. They had been so toxic, the parents in the emergency department, that security had been asked to remove one of them. Um, and then this dad was asking me for guarantees and reassurance that the fracture would remodel. One year later, this is the fracture. There is barely a sign that this fracture that a fracture had occurred. There is still some thickening if you look carefully at the in the uh, diaphysis there, but otherwise there's no angulation. And there is no, if you look at the soft tissue shadow, there's no visible deformity. I wanted to say in your face at the dad, but sadly they had divorced and it was a mother that brought the child along. But we knew that this was going to remodel. I'm sure you all did as well. The child is young enough. The um, fracture is not angulated. But what is the acceptable in the distal radius? Well, here's a table. This is a table that's been ratified by Price and was drawn up orig originally by Freiburg in the 70s. And it's based on radiological assessments. Hundreds of children were looked, their x-rays were looked at at variable times after the initial fracture. Not a great study, but what this study found was that in younger children, you can accept a, a good 20 degrees of angulation in the sagittal plane and um, I'm sorry, I spelt sagittal long. Um, you can accept 20 degrees of angulation and you can accept about 15 um, 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 degrees in the coronal plane. It gets less, the coronal plane is less forgiving, but, as, um, but you'd expect that, wouldn't you? There's very little coronal plane movement in the wrist joint, uh, well, uh, unless you're doing a royal wave, but there is an awful lot of flexion and extension. Therefore, sagittal deformities will remodel in a more predictable manner. As you can see, the older a child gets, the less you can accept um, um, deformity. But look at this. Only 15 degrees can be accepted in the nine to 11 year olds. But let me just dissect what I've just said, can be accepted. Remember these studies which drew up these tables, which have become accepted wisdom in orthopedics were based on full radiological resolution. And they, the radiological resolution was done at different times since the fracture. When you look back at those original articles, do you need full radiological resolution of, rain, of, the, um, um, of the fracture of the bone um, to get full functional and full visible um, 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 normality? That's a question I'm going to come back to. Many of you will be involved in the craft study, which is looking at this various, very matter for distal radius fractures. Let's now talk about the more worrying fractures. These are the mid shaft radius and ulnar fractures. Why do I say it's more worrying? Because I find this, even after 10 years of um, doing little else, very, very hard to predict. Um, what, um, there are many factors involved in the mid shaft of the radius and ulna. First of all, it is not close to the physis. Secondly, there are three planes of movements here. There's flexion, extension, and more importantly, rotation. And how do you assess rotation on an X-ray? 
you, you can't. The closest we have is to look at um, ulna, um, stra um, how straight the ulna is. That gives us an idea of the, how rotated the ulna is on the um, initial X-ray, but that's only an idea. You also have an idea if you look at the loss of the radial bow, how um, whether or not that, um, that that's a sort of an indicator of how malreduced it is. You, if you were to um, um, anaesthetize the child and look at their pronation and supination, maybe then you could make an assessment of how much rotation they have. But often you can't assess rotation until many, many weeks after the cast has come off, when they've got that range of movement back. And often I can't assess it for months after the fracture, the cast has been removed. So can you see that this is a tricky fracture to manage? And yet what a common one. How often do we see these in our fracture clinic? Well, the same quality of work that Freiburg present, um, um, uh, did for the distal radius has been done by others in the mid shaft radius and ulna. And here you can see that in order to get X-ray resolution, X-ray remodeling, there's very little angulation that can be accepted in the mid shaft, about 15 degrees in younger children and about 10 degrees in the older child. Rotational deformities are a little bit more forgiving. Well, that makes sense because the bulk of the movement in the um, forearm is um, pronation and supination. D complete displacement can be accepted. Yeah, we, we know that. Um, um, as long as it's similar displacement of the radius and the ulna. And then the loss of the radial bow. Yes, in younger children, they will remodel better than older children. Older children, you have to be mighty careful. So this is a girl here who I only saw last week. So this is a girl who had sustained um, mid shaft fractures back in January. And then um, um, in August last year, she fractured again. So that was some seven months after her original injury. And you can see that she fractured at the uh, original fracture sites. Um, and that's because her fractures hadn't fully consolidated when her cast was removed. But this is now a year later. You can see that she's got no ulnar, she's got no ulnar angulation. Her radial bow is re resolving nicely. She's still got some angulation in the coronal plane of her radial bow. That's not nice and straight yet. But look here at the radius fracture site. We do not yet have clear distinction between the cortex and the medullary canal. We do have lots of new bone. But is this really strong enough to withstand a big fall? Probably, but not definitely. Furthermore, this girl, if you look at her closely, has lost 10 degrees of pronation in her forearm. She has never noticed. I only notice when I examine her carefully, I isolate the elbow from the wrist movement, and I can see that she hasn't quite got the 10 degrees of pronation back. She's got full supination, but doesn't quite have the last 10 degrees of pronation. Has she noticed? Has she buffalo? Because you can um, recreate full pronation just by um, rotating your shoulder and lifting your elbow ever so slightly. She hasn't noticed at all. But the x-rays don't lie and nor do um, nor does a thorough examination. Does it matter? Probably not. And this is the femur fracture again. This is the same baby that I showed you last time. This was a neonatal birth fracture um, after they had to basically push the baby's head back into the birth canal and do an emergency cesarean section and pull the baby out forcibly and fracturing the femur as they did so, saving both the baby's and the mother's life, but creating a very worrying fracture for the parents. This was treated in a pavlic harness because these fractures heal extremely quickly in the neonate. So within a week, you've got enough callus um, um, for the baby not to be crying anymore when they're handled. Um, before that week, by the way, this fracture hurts. We just don't notice because newborn babies cry a lot anyway. It's quite a brutal way of managing fractures, actually, the public harness. Effective, but it works. But a public harness will not reduce this fracture to any um, good degree. And this remained at 70 degrees until the child got older. And as I mentioned, no coronal plane deformity, um, 30 degrees of residual um, um, deformity at the um, shaft, um, at, the at the fracture site, but no visible deformity. 
And this is ex accept, expected in these um, parameters that we have for what's acceptable in the femur. A quick word about shortening. Just because shortening will correct doesn't mean that you should leave it short. I have done a lot of work on this. I've, look, I've looked at about 30 children now over the last few years, um, which I've treated with pretty precise reduction in a hip spiker. I've gone to great lengths to reduce children precisely. And I know that even if you reduce children precisely with no shortening, they won't overgrow. If you are left with some shortening, then they will overgrow. And you can tolerate about 20 millimeters of shortening in most children with fractures. And that's your two to five year olds. Those are the children that fracture, the, the toddlers and upwards. And but that doesn't mean you should leave it short. Does that is that clear? Just because they'll correct doesn't mean you should leave it short. When I was and I say this because for a long time when I was a registrar, I would hear from people leave it short because they're going to overgrow. No, they only overgrow if you leave it short. And then the tibia. This is the most unforgiving bone in both children and adults. Um, it takes forever to heal and you cannot tolerate much deformity in the tibia. Just have a look at this. Um, you can tolerate in the older child five degrees of coronal plane deformity at most. Sagittal plane deformity, five degrees in over eight-year-olds, 10 degrees in um, under eight-year-olds, shortening, not very well tolerated at all, rotation, devil to measure um, radiologically, it's almost impossible to measure and very unforgiving. Furthermore, the tibia is virtually subcutaneous through most of its length, which means that deformities are obvious. It creates a visible asymmetry. The, you put your feet, the feet are directly below the tibia. So if your foot positioning is affected, for example, with a coronal plane deformity or with an axial plane deformity, that means a valgus varus deformity or a rotational deformity, your foot is going to be positioned differently. And again, asymmetry is noticed. Now, this is a fracture that I had about three weeks ago. You can see that this fracture is about eight, six or eight weeks old at this stage. No sagittal plane deformity, three degrees of um, varus deformity. But the foot was nearly 20 degrees externally rotated compared to the opposite side. If you don't look for these things visibly with your naked eye, looking at the position of the tibial tuberosity compared to the medial and lateral malleolar axis or the second metatarsal on the foot. If you don't look, you will miss this because radiologically you would not know that that foot is so rotated. So this patient was taken to the plaster room and under gas and air, the cast was removed and, um, and, I, visibly, and I cracked the callus so that I visibly corrected the foot deformity and then re-x-rayed. If I hadn't done that, this child would have healed and then would be walking with one foot pointing out compared to the other side. And I have seen plenty of children refer to me two years, one year after their fractured tibias who are walking in an asymmetric fashion. And they come to me for a derotation osteotomy. Very avoidable. And then let's talk a little bit more about this concept that I'm trying to introduce you to, to meaningful deformity compared to radiological deformity. This is a supracondylar fracture that has been fixed and healed in malrotation and, um, um, and in some hyperextension, um, uh, sorry, hyperflexion rather of the distal fragment, but malrotation. Okay, you can see that both on the AP and on the lateral. This is two weeks after wires were removed, approximately six weeks after fracture. Now, in the beginning of my career, I would have been eager to take this back to theatre and correct, but I've become a little bit older and wiser. Two years after that, this is the x-rays. So there's still malrotation, okay, as measured on um, um, the AP film. If you look at the lateral film, nicely, nicely um, healed, but look at the anterior humeral line, still not back to normal. But now look at the patient. So it, I'm really sorry, this is a proper photo taken in clinic. 
you can see from his hands that he didn't um, hold his hands still, even though I had positioned him in the in that two seconds it takes for me to position the child and then take the photo. He can fully supinate his arms. It's just that he um, 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 angulated his forearm at the last moment. But despite that, I hope you appreciate that there's a very subtle difference in the carrying angle. There's a very subtle difference to how much flexion this boy can do. So this is a fracture side, how much flexion this boy can achieve compared to his unfractured side. But he hasn't noticed, his parents haven't noticed, this makes no functional consequence, nor have they even noticed this very subtle asymmetry. So I would have been wrong, in my opinion now, to have taken him to theatre at week four or week six after fixation um, to, um, to re-correct that, because actually there is no functional consequence to that slight malunion. And the more we understand this um, going moving forwards, um, the more we can um, appreciate that x-rays aren't necessarily everything in children. Anyway, sorry to have confused you all and um, um, uh, reawakened your thinking. Let's go to some um, questions that we get asked. Will I go beep at the airport? Will the scanners pick up my implants? So the answer is possibly. It depends on the airport and the scanner. And I'm sorry, but a doctor's letter will not help. So let's explore this a bit. So remember, the function of airport detectors is not to pick up orthopedic metalwork. It's to pick up metal that could be a weapon and it's to pick up liquids that could be a weapon and also to a smaller level, organic contraband, um, um, pick up drugs in particular coming into the country. So the types of airport scanners that you're, that patients and passengers, I mean, are going to meet are basically ionizing radiation units. That's basically x-rays and non-ionizing radiation units. Not all of us are physically going to go through a ionizing radiation unit. So um, a transmission x-ray machine is basically a conventional x-ray. Unless you're suspected of smuggling drugs, you are unlikely to go through one of these. They're, they are, exist in every airport and they're there and they um, have a higher degree of radiation than a conventional x-ray and they're specifically there to pick up pellets and condoms full of drugs. But your baggage is going through an x-ray machine and I do wonder about this actually because this is again at very high doses and these fabric flaps here, these lead lined flaps are there to protect us from all that radiation that uh, is going on adjacent to us as we walk past. So these are transmission x-rays. They, um, they transmit the x-ray beam and um, the degree of attenuation by the material um, um, gives the, the image. In contrast, a backscatter radiation machine is one of these. Um, the, um, this is uh, um, uh, transmitting very low levels of radiation and um, um, in the form of x-rays and it measures what is reflected off the passenger. So um, 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 metalwork is going to reflect higher amounts of um, 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 x-ray than, um, than fabric and fat. These are present apparently in Manchester and Glasgow airports. Um, they're present in many European airports, but have been banned in the US since 2013. Um, there was a lot of concern in the US about these um, backscatter radiation machines. They are likely to pick up arthroplasties, um, but, um, and the, but it's a radiation that really frightened um, most um, free thinking Americans. Even though the amount of radiation in this is in the degree of millisieverts, there's much more radiation in this machine and there's much more radiation um, on the actual flight that you're about to go on to. And this is the degree of image that it gives you. You can see that it does pick up metalwork very accurately, the jewellery, the, the contents of this lady's belt. And the fact is that you can pick up the patient's gender very easily. And one of the um, big lobbies um, to um, stop these sorts of machines was actually from the transgender community who said that um, um, their community have gone to great lengths to change their genders and they didn't want that gender um, 
change to be easily picked up by complete strangers at the airport. And so, yeah, 2013, not used in the US anymore and now used in um, um, some European airports. Now let's look at the non-ionizing radiation units, basically metal detectors, which are um, electromagnetic currents in electric um, um, AC currents with a coil and, um, and which create eddy currents around metal. And then the, um, and then, um, the detector picks up a change in the magnetic field. Behind this gentleman is an arch metal detector, which has many um, um, little um, 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 coils in it as the patient as the passenger passes through. And then here, this gentleman, the, the um, security gentleman, is using a handheld metal detector. The handheld metal detectors are much more sensitive than the arch detectors. Then you have something called, um, I need to look this up because I keep forgetting, AIT, Advanced Imaging Technology, also called the Millimeter Wave Scanner. And I think they call them these machines because nobody wants to call them by the more accurate name, which is the Microwave Scanner, um, because that's what it uses, is microwaves. Um, very, very similar to the, um, 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 in, in that it uh, creates these microwaves and it measures the amount of absorption. This is the sort of image that it gets. It's very good for detecting um, substances, um, whether they're silicon, um, um, liquids um, um, or metal on the patient's skin. Not so good for looking inside the patient. Interestingly, that same lobbying group, the transgender community, um, have managed to get the, the, um, these gingerbread type images um, um, sanctioned through most countries, which means that the person actually looking at the um, scanner um, is going to be seeing images like these on the right. So they're not actually seeing the true um, image that is possible. Nowadays in the UK, the, this level of um, picture on the left is visible to somebody that is not in front of the passenger. The person in front of the passenger sees this image on the right. And, um, and once it's picked up some metal, whether it's from loose change or a key or a brass um, 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 brass strap, you, you go through to a man with a, or a woman with a metal detector who frisks you as well. So nowadays, um, up to about um, uh, three quarters of arthroplasty implants will get picked up. It depends on the scanner and how sensitive the metal arch has, be, has been made. Um, and you can vary the metal arch sensitivity in most scanners. So at a time of heightened security alert, they'll increase the gain. Most people will start going off and then they'll, the security will get slower as um, more and more people get frisked. Cobalt chrome alloy implants are more likely to go off than titanium ones. Fat people, thin people, it doesn't matter. Um, it'll still go off. And the more arthroplasty you have, the more metalwork you have, the more likely it is to get off. Handheld detectors are more sensitive than metal arch detectors and um, that microwave millimeter AIT scanner that I've described. And patient anxiety. Patients really worry about this for some reason. I think because a lot of people worry about airports altogether. And 12% um, of people with spinal implants report significant stress and anxiety when traveling about this alone. That is stress and anxiety, which is so severe that it puts them off traveling. 12%. I, I, I can well believe it because I get asked this question all the time, but that just tells you how, how frightened people are about airports and anxious people are about airports. So what I would say to patients is that um, is that most implants are not going to go beep. Arthroplasties are more likely to go beep, but different scanners in different airports at different times will have different detection abilities. Next question. Can you stop my cast from being so itchy? Now, cast itchiness is almost universal. If you've ever had a cast, it can drive you to distraction and despair. So this is a question that is valid, isn't it? The amount of distress that gives people. Can you stop my cast being so itchy? No, I can't. Itchy casts are very common 
and they can be very distressing. It leaves people to do all sorts of things like um, stick knitting needles and spaghetti down their casts. It's worse in the summer. Um, it's, uh, it's to do with moisture and um, skin. And the heavier the cast material, so plaster of Paris is a bigger problem than um, synthetic casts. The hotter the weather, the hairier the patient, the more likely they are to have, have itchy casts. All advice available is anecdotal, very little research into this. It seems from anecdotal forums and talking to patients and talking to plaster technicians that cooling hair dryers and fans where the cold air can be directed under the cast is probably the most effective comforting device. Some people advocate putting an ice pack on the nearest area of exposed skin basically to confuse the brain into the, the fact that the skin is being cooled under the cast. Antihistamines are commonly suggested but actually this is not really a histamine um, evoked itch. This is not an insect bite. So I don't think an antihistamine is little better than a placebo. And um, I would not recommend uh, mechanical devices to scratch, although I must confess I would use them myself, because unfortunately we've all seen, I suspect, painful excoriations and infected scars um, as people really itch under their um, um, casts. And that very moist, dark, dank environment is also a breeding ground for skin infections. There's been um, um, an attempt, there's been this lovely um, calamine lotion um, um, randomised control trial where um, in children's upper limb fractures, um, the plaza technicians applied a layer of calamine lotion to the skin before the cast was applied and then asked pe people about the level of itch they had. So, um, um, unfor so it, it did seem to work, but Unfortunately, this was a poorly randomised study and the um, calamine group seemed to be older and have cast for shorter amounts of time than the non-calamine group. And secondly, if you were not getting calamine lotion, you knew about it, whereas the calamine lotion people knew about it, they didn't have a placebo cream that was non-calamine to put on the, um, um, in, in the non-calamine group. This is something, when I saw this product on the internet, it made me despair that I haven't thought of um, 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 a cooling device myself, because if someone's making money out of this, um, um, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. This is something called a cast cooler. This retails for $55 in the United States. Um, it's basically this fabric put around your cast. And this here is a vacuum cleaner nozzle. And so the idea is that it dries your cast because vacuum cleaners, domestic vacuum cleaners are well known for their drying effect. And, um, and, um, and I just think it occupies the patient. I think this is just a glorified placebo. And then what I also wanted to then mention was this. This is, um, I don't know what part of the body this is, by the way, but this is a picture I found on the internet of folliculitis. Um, hairy, sweaty people can sadly get a proper folliculitis. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's the little tiny sterile pus for, uh, pustules at the base of the hair follicles. It, it's itchy and sore, reddened skin. And what I would recommend for this is you see it when the cast is removed, is to make sure the cast remains removed. And I particularly like these sorts of creams, which are combined fusid fusidic acid and, um, and betamethasone, um, so steroid and cream. And it seems to get it better quicker. Uh, but I think all they need is a wash and some cooling. They need that cast not to be on. But that is sore and itchy. And it's worth thinking about if somebody's very symptomatic. So why is my limb hairier? The answer, nobody knows, but it's a common um, occurrence, particularly in children and adolescents. So can, have a look, this is, um, um, this is um, um, from an article. Um, it's called Acquired Localized Hypertrichosis or ALH. It occurs in about 35% of individuals, mainly children and adolescents. And the hair that results in this hairiness is not only denser, but it's longer and coarser. The diameter of the hair is also thicker than the non-hairier side. And it looks like in certainly, it occurs even in very small children that it's a velus to terminal hair transformation difference. 
Um, a lovely longitudinal study found that 80% of it has disappeared after six months of cast removal and about 20% will disappear after 12 months. Nobody knows why it occurs. It, um, some people have postulated it's due to hyperemia, but I would suggest, hang on a moment, why do my patients with plates and TENS nails not get it? Um, um, they also have hyperemia at their fracture sites. And some people suggest that it's due to chronic irritation, inflammation, and friction of the plaster cast. But then why do my Ponsetti chill babies not get it? You know, they have plaster cast, but they don't have a fracture. So I don't know what causes it. It's interesting. And I've been thinking about plaster cast crash helmets um, um, in my um, um, baldness clinic that's going to make me a million pounds. But um, I don't know if that would work. Maybe I need to cause a fra skull fracture as well. Anyway, um, um, I'd love to know the answer to this. I see it all the time, um, but nobody knows. All I can say is that it will get better. Six months to a year. And then this is a question I get asked quite a bit. Is the bone stronger than before, doctor? The answer is no. Um, just because the bone is thicker, which it usually is on x-ray and physical appearance in subcutaneous um, bones, just because the bone is thicker, it doesn't mean it's stronger. The bone needs to be mechanically back to normal. It needs to have normal alignment. It doesn't, um, um, it, the cortex and the medullary canals should be distinguishable on x-ray. Then you can say it's as strong as it was before. And then most importantly, the muscles around the bone need to be strong. That's what makes bone strong as well. It's the supporting structures, the soft tissues. And you consider refractures, you know, particularly in children. 2% of children's fractures will refracture, usually in the mid shaft and usually in the forearm, usually within the first six months. There was a very a lovely study of 14, um, sorry, of 12 patients and where they looked back on every patient very precisely. They found that these refractures occurred a good three, three months or so after removal of cast. And all the patients that had refractured, all of them, didn't have circumferential consolidation. That means four out of four cor cortices um, that had fully united at the fracture site when they looked back. And I do, I do urge you to be mindful, particularly in the forearm. When you take off that cast for good, you make sure that you have proper, decent bone healing at that fracture site. Otherwise, you take it off at your peril. Get an x-ray is my advice to you. Don't just take a, a cast off automatically at week six without an x-ray in the forearm. Um, you need to have good circumferential consolidation if we're going to reduce our risk of uh, refracture. And then I get this question quite a bit. What can I eat, doctor, to make um, my fracture heal faster? And the answer, I think, is everything. Probably. Um, so I'd like to talk about this very interesting study published a couple of years ago. This is called the EPIC study, um, which looked at um, 55,000 people from 1993 to 2001. And they found that vegans and pescatarians um, had, a 20, had 20 more cases of fracture per thousand people over a 10 year period. So in other words, vegetarian and vegan diets um, have um, higher rates of um, fracture, particularly hip fractures, compared the, to what I'm going to call the omnivorous population. Very, very interesting that, because um, um, particularly for me, when so many adolescents these days are um, switching to vegetarian and vegan diets for ethical reasons, very laudable ethical reasons, except when you when I sort of really start talking to people about what they're eating, I'm afraid it does seem to be mainly potatoes and pasta um, rather than legumes, vegetables, soybeans, that sort of stuff. Um, but um, um, so what we have found is what foods help you to heal faster? Well, very little research in this subject. In the animal model, vitamin C supplementation um, accelerates fracture healing. Um, um, and we know that the vitamin C supplements inhibits differentiation of precursor cells into mature osteoclasts. So perhaps by reducing the amount of osteoclasts, um, you increase the amount of fracture healing. 
But remember, you do need osteoclasts for bone remodeling. You know, it's um, it's not all an osteocyte and osteoblast function. But anyway, fracture healing in animal models, vitamin C has been found to be useful. Zinc has also been found to be useful in animal models. It inhibits different differentiation of osteoblastic and osteoclastic activities, but increases the number of osteocytes. And then the other thing to remember is that dairy products are the best dietary source of calcium. But also remember that people in the United Kingdom do tend to get calcium, um, don't tend to be calcium deficient. Isoflavones um, found in guava, watermelon, um, tomatoes also have an anabolic effect on bone, metal bone, metal bone metabolism, so reduced osteoclastic activity. And carotenoids um, found in sort of basically orange and red vegetables reduce bone resorption. So in other words, if you're a good vegan, eating soybeans, leg legumes, um, um, chickpeas, um, um, variety of um, orange and um, yellow and dark green vegetables, you're probably okay. But most vegan, particularly most vegan teenagers, I would argue aren't stringent about their diet as, as some vegans are. So yeah, I do wonder what's, what's going to happen to them in the future. As I say, we know that in, a, in 10 years, there are 20 more cases of fracture per thousand people if you're a vegan, vegetarian or pescatarian. <coughs> so let's start our um, 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 MCQ poll. And everyone see them. So let's go for it. So what amount of displacement is acceptable in a 10 year old boy? This is based on conventional um, thinking, those articles that are described. Have a think about how stringently do you measure this in your, um, in your fracture clinics? Well done. You are fantastic, safe, safe doctors. Oh, sorry that you hadn't finished. Ah. I'm so sorry, I, was, I thought I was premature then. It was like um, basing, um, basing the whole Euro, Euro, um, uh, Europe, that Euro pop quiz based on Luxembourg's results. When, when do we stop this polling, by the way? Should we stop now? Uh, so it's more than one question. Um, oh, I see they're doing them all. They're oh. doing them all, if that's okay. Yeah, all right, go for yeah. it. Sorry, sorry, I thought so, we were doing it one at a time. Okay, go, go, guys. So I'll end it in one minute 30-ish. Right. Da -da -da -da. Finished. Yeah. Right, okay. So what amount of displacement is acceptable in a 10 year old boy? Well, based on old um, conventional articles, the majority is correct. You're good, safe doctors if you only accept 10 degrees of sagittal angulation. 20 degrees of sag sagittal angulation would have been acceptable if he'd been nine, um, um, but yeah, 10 degrees. Coronal plane, no, five degrees at this age. Rotational angulation, uh -uh, no, and 30 degrees, that's much too much. Right. Fracture risk in vegans. So this is is always higher than omnivores. No, it's not. It's um um it's um it's if you're a really good vegan, chickpeas, legumes, soybeans, watermelon, guava, carotenoids, carrots, dark green vegetables, um um you can you can supplement your diet adequately, but most um vegans um or sorry, uh, sorry let me re rephrase that. How would I know what most vegans do? Most of the vegan teenagers I meet are basically a, in a, on a chip based diet, and so that wouldn't be true for those poor people. Is higher than in pescatarians? No, I'm afraid those they, their risks are about the same according to the big epic study. Is highest for hip fractures correct? So it's the hip fractures are the fractures which they're most at risk for. Is 20 times that of omnivorous people? No, um, it's 20 more cases per thousand people over a 10 year period. Should be highlighted at falafel stands and festivals. Oh, come on, you jokers. You know? 
Who are you three people who think it should be highlighted? <laughs> Maybe you're right. Okay. And then which one of this is true about airport security? Um, let me see. Airport security measures pick up 20% of hip arthroplasties. That's, you know what? I always find this sort of question confusing. So the answer is yes, but actually they pick up 50 to 80%. Microwave scanners pick up 80% of hip arthroplasties. No, they, they're not very good at all at picking up arthroplasties. They're very good at picking up necklaces, belts. Um, bra straps, um, they're, they're good at picking up um, silicon breast implants, but they're not good at picking up um, ar um, arthroplasties. Backscatter x-ray machines are present in all airports? No. Um, um, European ones, yes. If you're interested in this, microwave scanners, AIT scanners, that's the other name for them, or millimeter scanners, um, are not used in Germany because they um, a, a very sweaty person will also um, set off that machine. So, um, um, so they they didn't use them. They didn't adopt them at all in German airports. So they're more likely to use backscatter X-ray machines in German airports. Handheld metal detectors detectors are more likely to pick up an implant than an arch metal detector. Absolutely correct. And 80% of passengers will pass through a transmission X-ray detector. No, your luggage will, but not you, unless you're suspected of um, um, carrying internal drugs. Sort of interesting, isn't it? I doubt very much those questions. Question one might come up in your FRCS exam. I'd be very surprised if the vegan and airport question does. But it, I don't know. This is this is about pragmatic, real life um, clinics. I bet you get asked those questions. Lovely. So can can I talk to you? Um, are you are you listening? Do you want to talk to me? Do you want to switch on your microphones and share? Yes, please do. Thank you very much, um, Kadeep. But um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat. Oh, so, <laughs> oh, here we got Hash has got his hand up. I know he wants to practice Viber, but Hash, do you have Go a question? On. Go on, Hash. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. In terms of circumferential uh, healing and yes. long bone fractures, like both bone forearm for the yes. upper limb and the uh, tibia fractures, how long is enough to keep the cast, like if it's above elbow or above knee cast, uh, to, in terms of gaining such circumferential hearing, healing? And do we re rely only on x rays for that? And mm -hmm. Because the problem is stiffness at the same time. Uh, You're absolutely right. So, um, so, 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 I'm going to answer this in a really long way. Okay. So, first of all, children will tolerate an upper limb above elbow cast in the upper limb for a very long time. Okay, and um, and I and I accept it for a good eight nine weeks um, um, until I get that circumferential healing in the um, in both bones. To my certain knowledge. My definite knowledge, I over the last few years, I've had two children who um, have refractured um, um, after um, and the one that I presented was one of them. I think um, that's not a that's not a proper randomized control study, but um, but the studies that exist highlight the importance of that four out of four cortices in the mid shaft of the forearm in particular. The elbow is forgiving in children. Something else that you can consider is a removable splint um, in the forearm um, once you have three out of four cortices. Um, I don't use it very often, but I have used it a couple of times um, when um, children, the odd child has been particularly slow to heal. Um, but I is wouldn't that use- above elbow splint? No, or? below elbow. Yeah. Okay. okay. But what I do not do is change people to below elbow casts. So you know how a lot of people, especially people, registrars who come to me in their rotation, talk about above elbow cast for four weeks and then below elbow for two weeks or whatever. You know, I don't. I keep people in an above elbow cast for six weeks and I find that they get full elbow range of movement within six weeks. Um, and they get very good range of movement within three weeks. But if you really want full range of movement, it takes six weeks. And children are very forgiving for that. That's without okay. physiotherapy. OK, um, the tibia, the tibia takes a long time to heal in children. I call it the most unforgiving bone. I had a series of patients pre lockdown um, with tibia patients that took so long to heal. They were excluded from school for so long that I had three children um, um, self harm with um, 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 suicide attempts. 
this is not this is over a long period of time mark you but you know before lockdown it was um, pretty conventional for children to be excluded from school for health and safety reasons or for children to be taught in a ground floor classroom with the special needs children so away from their social peer groups and um, so away from their friends, away from their study groups. And so um, the children became distressed as a result. And we even did some, um, some psychological studies on children with um, 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 lower limb fractures. And this prompted a few things. First of all, we realized from our psychological st stuff that um, children with pre-existing psychological issues were more likely to have psychological issues after a tibia fracture purely because of the amount of time of immobilization, which prompted me to be a little bit more aggressive when treating these children with metalwork. So I'm more likely to fix with nails or a plate these days, um, simply so I can get the children back to school quicker, so I can get them out of cast quicker, because as soon as a child can use a toilet independently, they can pretty much go to school. However, lockdown changed all that. With lockdown, suddenly everybody was um, learning remotely and schools became much more efficient at teaching remotely. And uh, what I have found anecdotally is that schools are much more readier to exclude children um, for fears of health and safety because they know they can teach their children via Microsoft Teams or whatever. Um, it's been a real problem, lockdown and integration of my patients back to school. But uh, does that, that doesn't answer, you, well, that does answer your question, but it gives you a bigger answer than you bargained for. Thank you very much. May I ask another question? If that's sure. Okay? Go on, Hash, it's you. you and me. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to know in terms, if you put a K wire in the distal tibia or in the distal radius, mm -hmm. for a, like Salter Haas type 2 injury, uh, when is it safe to remove that K wire? And is, is there a time limit for the K yes, wire? Yes, it to is. Be there? It is. You're fighting infection all the time. The longer you leave it in, the, the more likely you are to get an infection, particularly as bone resorbs around the K wire. So bone starts to resorb around the K wire at about week four. And as bone starts to resorb, the, the wire becomes looser. So there becomes more movement at the skin and indeed in the bone. Yeah, you, 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 you must have seen that, that bone resorption you get around a K wire. So Even that's... if they're buried, sorry. No, not if they're buried. You, you, can, you can keep them in for much longer if they're buried, but not forever. They will still loosen. But the, risk of, but the risk of infection does, um, goes down if they're buried. So, um, but then if you're, if you're burying them, you're giving them two lots of um, anesthetic. So why are you burying them? You're going to get callus formation within three or four weeks. Uh, yeah, uh, it was for a distal tibia fracture. Uh, was buried by the choice of my boss. Okay, would you do that? Um, not necessarily, because to reduce that uh, another trip to theater for the child, of course. But uh, this child uh, had, a, like you said, uh, many many stress and anxiety issues. And we thought uh, to put a cast uh, with K wires buried at the first time and plan a second trip in theater uh, to avoid anxiety and stress for him because we had uh, so much trouble with putting the cast even without as a first okay. aid management at the beginning for him. Well, I'm sure that's true. I'm sure I'm sure I have met many children like this, but um, 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 and it is easier to sometimes manage them with an anesthetic than it is anything else but we just got to be careful is it you is it your boss who's anxious or the child and um i'm not i'm just hash i'm i'm teasing you a little bit i don't know this child because and i believe me i've met children who are very anxious but yeah. you know in, in the right environment um with an ipad with a distracting de device a quiet plaster room um um perhaps gas and air you, you can take wires out extremely efficiently. You need very good pliers um, or bone holding forceps because you've got to be quick. Each wire must take less than a second to remove, but you can do that very, very efficiently, you know, um, um, but you need, you need to create the right environment and a mixed fracture clinic is not always the environment to do, to, to achieve that sort of luxury, you know, um, and most children have devices nowadays. You know, um, um, you, they are your friend. Okay, thanks. 
you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thanks for a great lecture. I I agree with you when you were talking about the rotation of the foot with the tibia fractures. That's one of my things as well. It's kind of like, just look at the foot, you know, don't yeah. look at the x-rays and, you know, what you think you did, particularly when they've had tibial nails. Um, yeah. I really, really, you know, the number of times I see it and I think, okay, we're going to have to sort this out. So thank you very much for your um wonderful lecture i'm sure we all learned a lot um and what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop the recording in a minute um and then we have three people who've put themselves forward for a viva session um so miss do you have, do you have a question you want to ask anyone we normally um viva them for five minutes as if it's in the exam and then we give them some feedback if you want to have a little break then we've got a couple of guys that can start off if you want to um and I, i'm ready to get to dive right into it can can i can the, the, can the three viva people introduce themselves can you switch your cameras on and your microphone mm -hmm.